my name is Jenny and I chair these sessions on behalf of Stroud District Green Party, uh, working alongside a team of fantastic um, hardworking people uh, in the background. So after a short break for the local elections, we're back with uh, the June Cloud Cafe, where we're talking about footpaths and the right to roam, which I know is a topic um, that interests so many people around the Stroud District because we're surrounded by beautiful footpaths and walkways and um, obviously a stone's throw from the Cotswolds Way. So we've got three uh, speakers with us today. I'll introduce them as we go, but um, oh yeah, just to say if anyone needs any support or has any questions, then uh, use the chat function to um, get in touch with Stroud District Green Party directly and we'll try and help you if you can't see or hear anything. Um, and if you've got any questions that you'd like to ask to the presenters, also use the chat as we go. And at the end of the session, there'll be um, lots of time to ask the questions to the presenters and um, make sure that we have a really lively discussion. So great to see so many uh, returning faces. Um, what we usually do is ask everyone to turn off their cameras and stay muted while we have the three uh, presentations. And then once we get round to questions, um, feel free to come back to us. Okay, so I'm going to start with uh, Daniel Raven Ellison, who is a guerrilla geographer and brainchild of Slowways, a network of 7,000 plus walking routes that connect all of Great Britain's towns and cities. Um, and you can find out more on a link that I will share in the chat. So Daniel, uh, take it away. Here's your 10 minutes. Thanks. Great, thank you very much. Yeah, my name's Dan, Dan Raven Lisson. Um, I'm in Exeter um, and I'm a guerrilla geographer. Guerrilla geography is radical, alternative, surprising, creative geographies that challenge myself and others to, to think differently about the world. And um, I'm the founder of the London National Park City and the National Park City Movement. And then this project around slow ways is something that I began um, well over a year ago now. So I'm going to share my screen um, and I'm going to tell you what this is all about. Uh, so slow ways. So slow ways really is an initiative that is all about getting more people walking more often further and for more purposes. Clearly, this is about our mental health, our physical health. It's about green, clean, uh, memorable, highly enjoyable uh, transport for getting between places for all those benefits. And I'm not going to go hard on those. because I know all of you listening in will know the benefits of, of walking. But what if we get more people walking more of the time? Now, I got thinking about this and clearly it's fantastic. We have a national cycle network, a visionary piece of work that's a strategic network of cycle routes that connect up our towns and cities, the places where most people are to where most people want to get to. But this is a network which is largely fragmented, it's largely on road and it's designed for cyclists, not walkers. And while we do have about 200,000 kilometers of public rights away and many more paths that we can use that crisscross the country and right to roam in up in Scotland and different parts of the landscape, I actually think that our footpaths, as glorious as they are, are actually a little bit of a mess. And what if actually we put it into a big system to make it easier for people to imagine how they could go on journeys through the landscape? So I got thinking about that and started playing around on Google Maps, thinking about the primary destinations that the Department for Transport and Ordnance Survey use when they think about transport planning. So these are the places that are most important as transport hubs, cultural hubs, but also population centres as well. And I just started playing around uh, um, just in Google Maps in a very rough way, creating these sort of geometric shapes that are really founded on a principle. This principle is that we should all be able to walk reasonably, directly, safely, enjoyably between any two neighbouring settlements. And I think if we can't walk between two neighbouring settlements reasonably, directly, safely, enjoyably, accessibly, then maybe something's going wrong. And actually for thousands of years, that's what we've done, right? And it's only since the advent of the motor car that maybe we haven't been able to do that through parts of our landscape. And it's interesting that that this is an idea when I pitch it to you might seem like an audacious proposition, but it's exactly what we achieved for road transport right across the globe. So why, why not remember the origin of our walking networks and think about creating a network for walkers in this way? 
So I called a hack day, which Jack Smith, uh, just sorry, Jack Cornish, uh, Jack Smith, another guy I work with, sorry, Jack. Jack Cornish actually came along to from Ramblers, which is great. This hack day in central London, where 70 people from across Great Britain came together and started playing around with the idea of a network of walking routes called the slow ways to connect up towns and cities across the country. And they were challenged to create routes that were as far as possible um, safe, legal, as direct, as off-road as possible, um, were as accessible as possible using public transport and that were um, easy to navigate. Crucially also having resting places where people could eat or sleep every five to ten kilometres. But the idea being that these rules would flex to the landscape. So you can imagine the notion of safety or having somewhere to rest, eat and sleep is slightly different in the highlands of Scotland than maybe it is um, in Cozy Stroud. Um, and in reality, the routes that people were creating weren't the straight lines you saw on the map just there. They're following these rules. And here you can see using OS maps, Ordnance Survey maps, this route going from Sonning Common over to Henley-on-Thames and Henley-on-Thames over to Maidenhead, wiggling through the landscape following um, those rules. Now, that day was such a success. We created nearly a thousand miles worth of routes um, that I had planned to organize hack days across the country to, to finish the project off. But then COVID hit and everything looked like it was going to not go so well. Um, but a core team of volunteers of about sort of 10 people from that original volunteering event got together and put the whole event together so it could work online using predominantly free resources, including very, very large Google spreadsheets. We put a call out, did lots of Zoom training, and 700 people came forward. 700 people who were stuck indoors because of COVID, who loved walking, who loved maps, who needed something positive to do with their time, who from their living rooms, their bedrooms, their kitchen sinks, wherever they were, were geeked out, creating routes, crisscrossing the country. Using this, you can see here, which is like this overview map that we created, which as you can see is far more detailed, that essentially links up the thousand most populated places in the country, all the towns and cities, and then lots of important nodes for creating connectivity within the network. And here you can see Stroud and Stonehouse down the bottom of the image here. And hopefully what you can see is that by using this geometric network that curates the different footpaths we have across the country into these trusted routes, you can begin to see more easily how you might walk to a neighboring settlement or how you might combine multiple slow ways to go on a long distance journey. This image I find really inspiring. So here you can imagine you're starting in Stroud or you can pretend you're starting in Swansea, but you can imagine how if we had a series of trusted routes crisscrossing the country here from Swansea going over to Norwich, then actually there are multiple ways in which you could complete that journey. So what if we could tell people the route which had the fewer styles if you've got slightly gammy knees? What if we could tell you the routes where there's the most accommodation for less than 50 quid a night? What if we could tell you where your friends are along this route? So you can begin to build up a picture of how you would uh, do a journey like this. And not just for recreational purposes, you know, what if you're at university in Norwich? and you've got the summer, so you're going to walk home to Swansea. Why not? What if you're dealing with a bereavement? What if you want to go to a music festival? What if you want to shop for something unusual? There are plenty of us who are willing to spend a little bit more time to have an extraordinary experience, to get in co contact with nature and the landscape, and just take a bit more time over this kind of uh, journey. So an interesting thing that came of the initiative is that, you know, I was thinking about connecting, making this network of routes connecting up places using existing footpaths. And what Jack will talk about, which is an inspiring campaign with Don't Lose Your Way, is predominantly about making sure that we inherit the footpaths that the ans our ancestors have created for us to make sure that we have them for future generations. But what you can see on here on this map are straight lines, which are the principled slow ways, the, uh, the, the slow way the route of the crow flies, and the wiggly lines are the actual routes that people need to follow. So looking at another part of the country down in Cornwall now, the places here where you see the highest level of shadow between the straight line, the principled slow way between the wiggly line, you see the places with the highest levels of deviation that are needed to complete a journey. So in other words, you can begin to see the places where if you were to cut off the dog legs and have more access through certain people's land, for example, then actually maybe more children would work to school or more people would walk to the pub or more people would walk to a music festival or to go shopping or whatever it is that else they're doing. So I think this presents almost like a vision for us of um, where we might need to have footpaths in the future based on what the landscape is like now that we can pass on to future generations rather than just thinking of footpaths as being something that is something that are, are, are more static. So phase one was about creating a first draft and a provocation. And an incredible map was created of 7,000 routes that stretch for 100,000 kilometers, the equivalent to two and a half laps around the equator, connecting two and a half thousand uh, locations. 
um, um, uh, those volunteers invested about a year's worth of time in a single month. Phase two of the project is to go and walk and review all these routes. So we know that everyone was making these routes from their kitchen sinks and their conservatories and their gardens and on the train or wherever they were. So we don't know that they actually work on the ground. So the challenge now is to have a national conversation about all these routes to go and te test them all. So we've pulled together some different funding partners to help us build a website. On that website, you can put in your location where you are. You can find your local slowways some of which will be fantastic and have been reported absolutely brilliant, some of which won't, won't work. And where they don't work, we want new or better slow ways. Or imagine this, um, for one way to get, for example, between Stroud and Stonehouse, well, actually there's multiple ways you might do that depending on your needs and desires, whether or not you need a more accessible route, a more direct route, a more enjoyable route. So actually we want to have multiple ways to communicate with each other for um, how you can move through the landscape. So you can type it onto our website, about where uh, you might want to explore. And what we're asking people to do is to go and walk their local or distant slow ways. So here you can see all the slow ways in principle that are radiating out of Stroud. And here are the actual wriggly routes, the actual lines as they actually are in the map that you can go um, and walk, download them to a device, draw them out on a map, whatever you want, go and walk them, check them out. And this just shows you what one particular route looks like in reality. So on the website, it shows you the, the length of the route and the distance. There's a grade there to tell you whether or not um, for people who have particular mobility requirements, whether it might be appropriate for them or not. And people can then also leave reviews to say how good they think it is. If three people positively review a slow way route, then it gets a snail with a tick on its shell and we think that it's trustworthy and other people can use it. So the ambition is to actually walk about 400,000 kilometers of slow ways collect collectively so that every route in the country is verified at least three times. So we have this trusted network we can use. And when you dive into the survey, actually we've got questions in there like, you know, is this route appropriate for someone walking with the St. Bernard dog or uh, in a wheelchair or um, do you need affordable accommodation, that kind of information. So um, since we launched six weeks ago, and I'm just about to finish, I know that I'm at my sort of time, um, We've had 14,000 kilometers of routes reviewed, which is incredible. Uh, 1,300 route reviews, but only 14 verified routes because it takes three people to peer review a route so it's verified. So what would be absolutely fantastic would be if any of you guys, where you are, uh, across, across Gloucestershire in Stroud, looked at the Stroud page on our website, look to see which routes have been reviewed or surveyed or verified and go out there and maybe be the first town, place, location, county, in the country to verify all your routes and help to create this network for other people to get walking more often, more purposes, further for more enjoyment. That's me. Thank you very much for your time. Wow, what a fantastic start to the night and um, what an amazing initiative and definitely all the councillors who are on this call, um, let's get Stroud signed up for something like this. Um, so yeah, I mean, just so many amazing things. Tailored journeys, making walking more accessible, I think for me was the standout thing, you know, um, making sure that people who have got push chairs or wheelchairs or whatever it might be, um, that they can still access this kind of, um, you know, beautiful nature that we've got is, is, is really amazing. Um, so yeah, I mean, I guess the biggest thing there is the call to action. Um, and everyone who's on this call, um, we will share, Oh, the, I've corrected, the thing has already been shared, the link's already been shared. So um, let's have a look and sign up as Stroud. And it's nice to see Stonehouse on the map as well. I'm actually in Stonehouse right now, so there you go. All right, thanks Dan for kicking us off. And um, let's move on to Jack. Jack, if you want to put your camera on, hi. So uh, Jack leads the Don't Lose Your Way campaign at the Ramblers, um, which is Britain's largest walking charity. He's focused on supporting volunteers um, in finding lost rights of way and researching historical research um, so that it can be applied to go back on the map and on the ground. OK, Jack, um, here's your 10 minutes. Thanks. Thanks. I'll just share my screen. Uh, hang on. Hopefully everyone can see that. Yeah, um, see. yeah, Dan always sort of slightly upstaged me with his uh, his fancy slides, but hopefully this will still be uh, uh, interesting. Um, yeah, so thanks very much for inviting me. Yeah, so I, I manage the Don't Lose Your Way project at the Ramblers. And as you say, it's all about finding and saving historic rights away across England and Wales. So I'm just going to give a bit of an overview and 
hopefully show off some nice old maps, which always sort of people always enjoy. Um, so yeah, uh, I have some slides about the history of the Ramblers, but I won't go into that much because I'm sure a lot of people know it. But I think the important thing that I would say is that we are a campaigning organisation, and we've got a history of radical campaigning that, that goes back to to 1935. And here's a picture of in the Scout, which is really the birth of the Ramblers, and um, in turn, you know, we, we have been instrumental in, in national trails, national parks, but also the public rights of way network that we've got now. Areas of open access land in England and Wales coming soon, the right to walk around the entire coast of England, and also previously the, the Welsh coast path. And the reason I think I've highlighted this is that I, I see Don't Lose Your Way as part of that, of that campaigning and part of that asserting the rights of the public to be able to access our amazing natural landscapes, but also our towns and cities. So, um, I know Alan's probably going to speak more about rights of way, um, but you know we've got 140,000 miles of rights of way, many of which will be featured in the Slowways map. Um, and every council has a requirement to have a legal map of those rights of way in their area. That's called the definitive map. You'll see these rights of way show up on ordnance survey maps but also on the ground when you see a, foot, a footpath sign when you're out walking in the countryside that you know that's part of the rights of way network and i think the, the thing i would say at this point is that it's a historic network this is a photo i took in the quantox a couple of years ago and this is um a drover's road um, that goes across the quantox that goes back many centuries I suspect and um, I've got a suspicion that the two levels of where that you can see there are where one uh, the bottom level is where all the animals that were being driven were um, were and then the slightly higher level is where the people had worn down the path so you know paths are part of our history and, and for me they're part of our sort of ordinary history of how we've navigated and, and interacted with our landscape over over centuries but these definitive maps they were starting to be drawn up in the 40s and uh, in the late 40s into 50s and 60s and essentially that was part of the Attlee government's um, drive to, to not just have rights but to make sure people knew where those rights were and what those rights were um, but is the map is the definitive map truly definitive um, we, we think that it's not and we know that there are thousands of miles of missing rights of way so these are these are these are actually rights of way, but they're just not recorded. And so that means they're not protected. And it means that people don't know where they are. And but we have, uh, as of today, four years, six months and 23 days to find these potential lost rights of way, to do historical research into them, and then to apply for them to go back on the map. So this is, so last, uh, last year, um, we had thousands of volunteers who came together to help us map potential lost rights of way across England and Wales. And I say that word potential because it was a paper exercise looking at historic maps, comparing them to the current map and seeing could there be something here that requires further research. I think this is just outside Stroud and um, here you can see the current OS map and this is what we potentially found in terms of lost rights of way. So, these are based, I think these are all based on the fact that there's a footpath on the historic map shown. Now that might have been private, I suspect it was public. The issue would be proving that it was used by the public in the past. But you can see, you know, if you added just one of these routes, it would create a great off-road route, um, you know, to more rights of way up here in the in the sort of northeast of the map. And so how this works is that essentially. We're, all, we're a volunteer-led organisation, and what we want to do is support any volunteers, and be fantastic if people get involved here, with taking one of these routes and then doing historical research. And essentially what that research needs to prove is that it was used by the public in the past. Now, the past can mean going back to, I think it's the 6th of July, 1189, and that is the accession to the throne of um, King John. Um, and that is the legal date of time memorial. So we can use any evidence going back that far that, that makes the case that a right of way was used by the public in the past and therefore it should be accessible and be able to be used now. And then that evidence is collected together and submitted to the council um, and it's called a definitive map modification order. 
So when we're talking about the evidence, um, I've got a couple of images. Uh, I think actually this is just north of Stonehouse, uh, interestingly. Um, so this is an enclosure map and um, you know it shows parcels of land that were owned and it also shows public roads. Some of them also show footpaths and bridleways as well. Um, and, and all of this is, is, about, is about really putting together lots of different pieces of evidence that make the case. It's, it's sort of rare you find one piece of evidence that, that proves it in itself. But I just sort of thought I'd show you some of the maps that are involved. Um, the next one is a tithe map. Um, so this was, uh, I think this is for Badbrook. Um, and again, this is sort of shows public highways. Some of them also show public uh, footpaths and bridleways as well. This isn't just about putting footpaths on the map. These are putting bridleways on the map or restricted byways. So things, you know, country lanes that were used in the past, putting those back on the map as well. Um, another piece of evidence, this is the uh, Finance Act map um, from uh, 1910. This was a, an act that was basically going to bring in a land value tax. So they mapped all the land in the country and they decided how much each landowner, uh, the, the value of each parcel of land. This is important because landowners got deductions for rights of way crossing their land. Um, people tend not to lie to the tax man because they get into trouble a lot. So it's pretty good evidence that if you can identify what the deduction was for, pretty good evidence that there was a right of way there in the past. But there isn't any set list of things that you have to use that, that, that can only be used. So you can use anything. So commercial maps, records when the original OS maps were, were drawn together, estate plans and, and, and maps uh, used by the sort of created by the, by the manor, um, railway records. So when a railway was, was built or even planned, they had to create these amazing long maps that are sort of rolled up almost like wallpaper um, that, that showed every single right of way that they were crossing. So, you know, they can be brought together. But there, as I say, there's no limits. Um, people, I've seen people use old photographs. Um, I've even seen someone use a cine film, um, uh, you know, to, to, to demonstrate the public were using it in the past. And we've had a volunteer in Sussex who even used a, um, an extract of Virginia Woolf diaries to show that the public were using this this path in the past and therefore they should be able to use it now. And I suppose some of these points are obvious, but, but for me, why it's important is that this is a bed, better network for all. These are public rights and they should be recorded as such. And, you know, we've got a fantastic network, but it could be better, I think, as the slow ways has shown. And having something recorded as a right of way is important because it gives it a legal status and it means that as a member of the public, you can be, you should be confident that a right of way, that it will be unobstructed, that you'll be able to walk it, it won't be blocked. Um, you know, if it's been ploughed, that the path would be reinstated. There's a lot of important things that come with having something as a right of way. And then the, the other one for me that I sort of touched upon at the beginning is that the rights of way network is, is part of our shared heritage. And for me, it's as important as an Iron Age hill fort or a cathedral in terms of our heritage. And it's part of the ordinary history of the country. And, and so, you know, it, it's, it's probably the, the part of our heritage that is still being used, the oldest part of our heritage that is still being used for its original intention. And so we really need to safeguard this network so it can be, you know, used and enjoyed for, for generations to come. I'm not sure where I am with time, but um, you can, you know, we'd love people to get involved. You can go and look on our website and see what potential lost rights away are in your area. You can also sign up to help with the, the next stage, which is, if anything, the biggest stage, the historical research. You know, take a path and, you know, with our help and training and support, you know, spend six months doing a little project, pulling together the research to, to actually apply for a path you put back on the map. And you've got my email address there if you've got any questions as well. And now the sun is really in my eyes, but. Oh, okay, great. Thanks, Jack. Yeah, no, fantastic. Another um, fantastic perspective on it. I mean, I think um, you've both uh, touched on, you know, the historical value of this. And, and I think so many of us have sort of fallen back in love with nature during the lockdown. Um, 
it's one of those things where it's as soon as it's taken away from you even slightly then that's the moment that you want it the most and I think that I guess what you're saying is like let's not get to that point where it's taken away from us and instead let's um you know put our hands up now and say um like you know these are our rights these are our walk like paths and roots and, and our history and and we want to protect them so um yeah absolutely thanks for um thanks for that jack okay i think we should have our final um speaker now alan alan if you've got your camera on and unmute yourself. Yep. Okay, great. So Alan's been involved in managing and improving public rights of way for over 30 years um, in the Northeast and in Gloucestershire, um, and has recently dipped his toe into the sustainable transport uh, pool. Um, he currently leads a small team looking after the day-to-day -day management and protection of 3,400 mile network across the county. Um, along with the role of, uh, with the access authority um, and powers associated with Crow Access Land, which I'm assuming you'll tell us what Crow means. Yeah. Um, and has recently spent time and resource improving the multi-user trail along the old railway line between Stroud and Nailsworth. So bringing it back to the local perspective. Thanks, Alan. Okay, uh, hello everyone. I, I, I haven't got a presentation, well I have, but I can't get it to, to join up to Zoom tonight. So uh, the wonders of local authority technology for you. Um, so you're going to have to look at my opening mug for a bit, or you can you can switch it off if you like. Um, go away and make yourself a cup of tea and just listen from a distance. Um, I'll just introduce you. It's going to be a brief, brief introduction to rights of way and Crow access land and, and what we do and what our role, role is. Um, basically, um, rights of way are types of highways. Uh, these are uh, routes over which the public have rights to pass and repass. They, that, that's undeniable rights, and they can only be stopped up by legal order. Um, there are a number of categories of highway in common law. The ones that you're most interested in are the, the actual categories on the definitive map, which are public footpaths, which of course people can walk along, um, or push a buggy or take you know, a usual accompaniment, might be a dog or something, uh, go in a wheelchair, you might not always get along them, that, that, that there's always a challenge. Um, bridle ways, you can take a horse, ride a horse, uh, ride a bicycle, and walk, of course. Um, a, um, and then there are versions of carriageways, which most roads are carriageways, um, but we have some called restricted byways, where there's a right to take a horse and cart, and all the rights associated with um, bridleways. And then there's um, a very small number of things called byways open to all traffic, which by their very nature open to all traffic, even if you probably couldn't drive down one. Um, and the County Council is the Highway Authority, and we have an overriding interest in the surface of all these routes. So um, that means, you know, if you think about your ordinary roads, that surface is put down by the council. It doesn't usually own the land underneath, but it owns the surface, and it's responsible for, for keeping it safe. Um, and they're protected in law by quite powerful law. And there's a, there's a, a legal adage which says, once a highway, always a highway. So that means it's very difficult, in fact, to go around changing them. So, Landowners can't just decide to change a right of way without going through a formal legal process. And uh, so there, there is a protection uh, in, in place which exists for those highways which are, and also the ones which aren't, or most of those that aren't recorded, um, which we'll come on to. Um, the highways, uh, highway have shown are two sets of records. Uh, there's the definitive map and statement, which I think um, um, uh, Jack referred to certainly. Um, the definitive map and statements, the one which we're main, mainly involved with here, which is the public rights of way, footpaths, by the ways, restricted byways and byways. There's also another associated um, record, which is of interest to people who want to get out and about, and that's called the list of streets. And that's translated into some things called the road records, and that's a record of all the routes that were in the 1930s considered to be roads. And some of those roads are unsurfaced green lanes. And so they're marked on those records, but they're not marked in, in many cases on the public rights of way record, the definitive map. And they're, they're an interesting adjunct to the rights of way network. And I think they're probably an important part of a potential slow ways network. And in some cases, they're more at risk than public rights of way because the road records and the list of streets are not as powerful documents as the definitive map. Now, the definitive map is a wonderful document in sense 
that it is conclusive evidence of everything it shows. And it shows a spider's web, particularly around the Stroud Valleys, of public footpaths and bridleways all over the place, particularly footpaths. Um, the the um, road records is a big, uh, and, and list of streets is a, a big document, but it's, um, it's mainly obviously the roads we're all used to driving along, walking along or cycling along but it's also those, some of those green lanes. And they're a bit more at risk because it doesn't have, it, all that is is a record of maintenance. But you can ask me more about that if you want. Um, going on, um, the legal record, the definitive map is accompanied by statements. That's a very important part of the document. And, and that um, details the parcels uh, of land on the 1923 one to two and a half thousand map that PASS went through. And um, that they're, they're fascinating. They're mainly provided by the parish councils back in the 50s and a uh, useful part of the documentation. Now, as I say, definitive maps are conclusive evidence in law um, about the particulars within them. Uh, but that doesn't mean other routes don't exist. And as Jack referred to, uh, there is a process now for adding paths to the definitive map uh, on the basis of document documentary evidence and archive evidence. And the, 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 the one reason I, um, I, I caveat slightly the once a highway is always a highway thing, is that in 2026, there's a cutoff date, which will mean that we can't claim pass um, on the basis, people can't claim pass on the basis of that archive documentary evidence, that those wonderful colorful maps that Jack was showing us. Um, so that's, that's, um, that's a shame, um, but that was a compromise made by the government uh, in 2000 when it brought in the Countryside and Rights of Way Act, or the Crow Act as we call it. Countryside and Rights of Way Act was the one which brought in uh, formal, uh, the, the formal ability, uh, the right to roam in England and Wales. Um, so I'll, I'll go on to that in a minute. Um, just to say, um, our different maps in Gloucestershire were finally completed, having been started in about 1950. Uh, in 1983 in Gloucestershire. It took a long time of review and drafts and uh, further reviews and hearings at the quarter sessions and um, a big involved process over many, many years. So the finished maps are very, very valuable, powerful documents. Um, uh, I will circulate this uh, PowerPoint at, at when I get the technology going, but uh, and I can look at these things at the moment. We've transferred all of our data from our dependent map onto an electronic map which people can view online uh, if they go to gloucestershire.gov.uk forward slash p-r-o-w and that, that's a website where you can find out information about rights of way in gloucestershire and, and bits and pieces of news and things like that um, worth having a look at and it's a colorful map it's much easier to read than the original dependent map and of course it's got modern features on it so it's the uh, effect of the old map overlaid over modern features and then with the changes that have happened in the interim. It does have inaccuracies in it though here and there. There are ways to change paths and landowners do come to us saying, look, I need to change this path to take it out to a farmyard. Um, and they can do that by going through a process called the public path order. And that takes ages. It's quite expensive to them um, and we don't have to agree to do it, but we, we do, we process about 20 or 30 every year, usually for alleged safety reasons or privacy reasons. And in fact, by and large, they've done by the, with the consent of all the user bodies as well, the ramblers and, and maybe the horse society, but the by way, for example. Um, so there's the other way to change the definitive map is to go through a process called a definitive map modification order. I think Jack referred to them. That's what the Lost Ways or uh, Don't Lose Your Way project will lead to. Um, if, if there's good enough evidence, a modification order will, will be made to change the map. Uh, it's a formal process. It's got lots of um, opportunities for people to object. And then often there'll be some sort of an inquiry if there are people, uh, you know, decide, you know, if the landowner objects and there's a lot of people pushing for a new path. And we've got lots of them going on a decent backlog of them happening in the county. Um, most of the work done by my team are just maintaining and protecting the network. We've got 3,400 miles or so of public rights of way in Gloucestershire. 
Um, and highways law requires that we ascertain, protect the rights of the public to use and enjoy public rights of way. Um, that's section 130 of the Highways Act 1980, since you're interested. Um, it also has lots of enabling legislation. Um, so we, we can deal with farmers who plough up paths or, or put crops on paths. That's a particular concern at the moment. We can deal with overhanging vegetation. Uh, we can deal with uh, bridges on rights of way and that sort of thing. So we, we do a lot of work to keep the network in, in uh, acceptable shape. It's not all perfect and there's, there's plenty to do. Um, in the typical year, we get about two and a half thousand reports from the public saying uh, this, this is this problem, this style's broken or it's muddy on the path or whatever. Um, during lockdown, we had a 50% increase in reports. So we're actually really struggling at the minute to keep up. So I'm actually spending quite a lot of my time dealing with complaints from people who haven't had reports dealt with because I haven't had an increase in funding. Um, local governments cash strapped at the best of times. And um, so my, my plea to anyone out there is be patient with us because we will try and get to things, but we might take a bit longer than you'd hope. Um, we have tricky issues right there from the same time, just looking at a photograph of a, uh, a path that's fallen into a river. Um, with the wet, wet, wet winters, I think climate change has, a, has something to say, that, uh, a, a cost to us, basically. Uh, the local, one of the local costs is increased erosion and issues on paths because we have exceedingly wet winters followed by exceedingly dry periods of time in the summer or spring. And we've had terrible problems with, you know, banks eroding and this sort of thing. So uh, there's a lot of, lot of stuff going on. Uh, but to do, to keep things in shape, we do engage a large number of volunteers in different places, often through parish councils and through the Cotswold Warden Service um, in this area in particular. So they are an invaluable part of us trying to make our money go a little bit further. I'm now going to talk just briefly about crow access land. Um, the Countryside Rights of Way Act in 2000 brought in the concept of crow, what they call open access land, which is land which was mapped then in the early 2000s, which was defined as mountain, moor, heath and down, uh, along with registered common land. And the mapping process was led by um, the organisation that became Natural England, uh, which was, I think at the time, countryside, the Countryside Agency. And it set out where the public has now qualified right of access on foot for open air exercise. And um, all the commons, for example, around Stroud have that, but in fact, they were accessible anyway by foot. But the additional land is usually in our area, in Gloucestershire, it's things like downland. There's a little bit of a lowland heath, but mostly uh, odd scraps of land and then bits of common that, of course, commons, people don't realise this, but commons before um, the 2000 Act were effectively private land. Um, with commoners had rights over them to graze maybe a certain number of cattle or sheep or to take wood or whatever, but um, it made commons accessible. So in fact, probably the big advantage of the Crow Act in Gloucestershire is that it's made some of the commons that weren't um, a, a, a open access land available to the public. Uh, I can think of a few which are like that. Map shown where the public has this so-called right to roam are held by Natural England and can be viewed online. Um, and they're also on Ordnance Survey maps, um, like the, the map behind me. Um, there are patches of land shown on it, which are in a very, very pale orangey uh, colour, which are uh, access land and land where the public has a right to uh, roam on foot. Uh, we are the access authority, is the county council, but we don't receive any funding to do that and we don't have any duties, we just have powers. So we can agree new accesses onto access land with landowners. And we did do a bit of that in, in the early days, but there's not a lot of demand for it, to be honest. Um, as I say, most of the land was already designated as accessible for the public in our area. The big advantage is areas where that that those rights weren't enjoyed. So big areas are common in the north, for example, and uh, Lake District, Peak District, places where people want to walk, but in fact, gamekeepers and landowners are very keen to stop people walking, often because they had grouse moors and this sort of thing. Um, that's all I've got to tell you for tonight. Uh, I'll let you ask some questions. I'm, I apologise again for you having to say my opening mode.
<laughs> thanks, Alan. No problem at all. But really, interesting. and again, thanks for bringing that um, local view. I guess it's um, you know talking about the power of documents, the power of documentation, and the limited time that we've got in order to uh, use that resource to um, map these routes, modify these routes, um, and add any routes that we think should be included as well. Um, okay, so I've been trying to keep an eye on the questions, um, which I think we've got a few. So um, I'll go first to Sue Fenton. Sue, do you want to come in and ask your question? If you unmute yourself. Hello, yeah. Um, <clears throat> hi. Yeah, I think my I've, I've done two questions. Um, my first question, which, which is for any of the speakers, actually, is, um, is, is there a problem? And if so, how significant is it with paths being blocked or obstructed deliberately by landowners? And, and what can be done about that, if so? Thanks, Sue. OK, so let's go, let's go in order of how we've been. So, Dan, if you'd like to go first. I'm not going to burn airtime. Alan and Jack are far more equipped to answer this question. <laughs> okay, thank, thanks for passing the torch. Okay, Jack, do you want to go first? Uh, yeah, I think, I mean, we do see these issues. I'm sure Alan sees these issues as well. Um, I mean, the, I think the numbers of deliberate obstructions are, you know, in the grand scheme of the network, relatively small. The, the issue I have is that I, I worry that if you come across one or two obstructions when you're out walking, what that does to your confidence about using the public rights of way network in the longer term. I mean, to some extent, some of the bigger issues, I think, and again, this will vary in different landscapes, are, you know, there's rights of way exist. As, as, as Alan said, they exist. If they're on the definitive map, they'll continue to exist and there's a big process to remove them. But in terms of actually them being usable, people need to walk them. And that's partly, you know, it's it, some of the biggest issues are with vegetation and things like that. So I would encourage people to, you know, see what paths are in their parish or in their village or whatever, and, you know, go and walk them once a year. And, and that keeping them walked is actually probably the biggest way of keeping them, you know, free and easy to use, I think. But Alan might have some things to add. Thanks, Jack. Thank you, Jack. Yeah, I think I think you're exactly right there. I think getting people out there to walk is is the most important way we can keep the paths open. Um, we we do have a problem with in some areas certain landowners who like to block paths who don't really want the public on their land. That's always been the case. It probably always will be. Um, people think their land is their castle and they're really not very happy when someone tramps up the path past their house and peers in the windows. Uh, let's face it, most of us live on a road, so we have people tramping past, peering in our, in our window all, all the time. So um, it's sometimes I think people think they can sometimes buy that level of privacy, but they can't. They've got a highway next to the house, which is what rights of way are. Um, we, we, and we, you know, of the three and a half thousand, three thousand seven hundred reports uh, we fielded in the last year on uh, uh, issues on public rights of way, a good number were about obstructions and box years, but some of them were the same ones that people were complaining about. So for example, um, um, a locked gate to, over in um, and Teddington uh, up in the North Cotswolds, which we, we subsequently de dealt with, had half, half a dozen complaints about that. So, so we, we do get groups of complaints and I do think there is an issue, and I think Jack's right to say, there's an issue with people's confidence in walking, because if you're um, a slightly nervous walk and you're out there, and you, you find the path barred or difficult to get along, then you might not want to do it again. And I think that's a, that's a real blow and that's a, a really bad for anyone's confidence and, and, and for the work that we're all doing in a sense together to try and give people um, the confidence to go and use their local network and to enjoy being out and about. If I, if I could actually dive back in again, I mean, to answer mm -hmm. the question from a just slightly different angle, is that I think the spirit of the question was about when like someone's got a giraffe in the middle of the path or there's like a, you know, the, the bridge is broken or whatever the issue is. Um, th there's another way of looking at it as well though, which is more about equity and inclusivity of the actual path infrastructure itself and both the geography of the landscape in terms of accessibility, um, but then also level of geographic information to let people know whether or not a route is possible or not. 
And one of the things we're trying to do in slow ways is ask people to survey routes to say which kinds of users might be able to use routes. And it's interesting because we battled for a long time about how we would grade routes and how we would do that kind of surveying. And what we came across is that an awful lot of the information that's out there that's done by the ac big accessibility charities effectively and professionals is basically asking about professional standards about the world they would like to see which then means for example you know how flat is the land the fact that the path needs to be a meter and a half across for accessibility but the problem with that is that it doesn't allow for um maybe some of those people who may have mobility requirements they might be a wheelchair user for example but they want to know whether a path is usable rather than rather than if necessarily it's completely accessible to, to everybody. And actually, as long as there's not a style in the way, they can get themselves at Penny Fan, thank you very much. And I think there's, which is a big mountain, by the way. And so I think that, th that there's actually a dearth of geographic information out there about where barriers are coming and going, but also those that are just permanently part of the landscape as well. And also a cultural issue that where access is communicated it's often to those with the highest needs and not necessarily catering for those who actually have an awful lot of wherewithal and resilience. And as long as they know they can get out of their wheelchair, scoot, squeeze through a gap, cl close their wheelchair, get back through again, they know they can carry on going for another 20 kilometers. And actually it's harder to get that information around. So separately from the slow ways, but, but one of the things we want to look at is that I think there needs to be a national barriers project where essentially people across different public rights of way authorities, across Ramblers, across National Trust, whoever, can tag to say where there's a barrier that's new and when it's gone again to anyone, whatever persuasion they have. And I think that's a massive issue in terms of access to the landscape. Um, but it's partially about those, those temporary things that a farmer might be doing to distract people. But in some ways it's more, some of the things like Jack says, like vegetation or uh, expectations around styles, those kinds of things. If, if I can just add something to that as well, if that's all right. Sorry, I know we've got more of a question. Yeah, but, no, don't um, worry. Don't worry. I, I completely agree with what Dan says. The other thing I'd add to that is I would love there to be a national data set of all of the benches in the country. You know, that's <laughs> wouldn't it be fantastic if you knew you were on a walk and there was a, a bench coming up in 10 minutes or something like that? And that's part of accessibility as well. Um, you know, but that's just something I always dream of. Maybe we could do a big crowd crowdsourced project where everyone could tag where all the benches are. And lose. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe it's something that um, you need to add to the review. How many loos did you find along the way? Um, okay, nice. So uh, just scanning through, I think Thank Dominic you. White is the next question. Thanks, Sue. Um, Dominic, are you there? Hi, guys. Thanks very much for the excellent presentations. It sounds um, really good. Um, so just to give you a quick insight, I uh, run a project called Nature's Races and it, that's basically try to, trying to encourage people to experience nature um, with the sort of long-term goal that they might then care about it a bit more. Um, the last 18 months, um, obviously we started off with some great positives. Everybody started going out for walks. Um, everybody was kind of giving nature a bit more space, uh, but certainly on the walks I was doing, the more and more people were sort of walking around the woodlands, uh, experiencing a bit more. You saw a very, um, uh, very obvious increase in the sort of damage that was happening, uh, the litter that was being left behind and everything else. I love the idea of, you know, people getting out there and in, enjoying nature. Um, do you have any sort of shared concerns that that could have a negative effect on, on nature as well with more people walking around? And is there anything we can do to kind of try and prevent that or police that or, you know, do something positive to sort of um, keep everything safe? Thanks, Dominic. Hands up. Go on then, Jack. You're first. Nice one. Sorry, I won't talk all the time. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I think that is, uh, obviously, that's a real, that is going to be a real concern. Um, I think I'd probably make a couple of points. One is with, one is that the more paths we have and the more and the better connected network we have, the, 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 the usage is spread out, you know, and I, and I really want to encourage people to use all paths. And, you know, for me, the amazing thing about a rights of way network is that it's hyper local and that it's extensive. It's not just about, you know, damage to a national trail. We haven't just got national trails, we've got paths everywhere. So I suppose there's an issue of, you know, in terms of the damage to paths of, of actually spreading out, <laughs> you know, getting people enjoying all of our landscape. Um, 
And I had another question. I had another point, but I can't remember what it is now. So um, <laughs> I might leave it at that and see if anyone else got anything. Yeah, Alan, Alan, and then Dan. I just want to say that there was we've had a big reaction from some landowners to people walking more widely, and that's partly because people um, aren't well versed necessarily in what the rules, what you might say the rules are uh, in the countryside. Uh, there's been a lot of um, ad hoc trespass and people walking all over the place, and that's partly because nobody gets talked about rights of way in schools. It's partly because there's some lovely places to walk and nobody stops you. Um, but it, it's it's created uh, a, a number of issues, and some farmers have ended up um, fencing in paths to try and keep people on the keep people on the right line. Not so much around Stroud, luckily, but uh, certainly over in the Cotswolds, we've had that issue. And I'm um, it, it is a concern for me that um, you know that that reaction will actually spoil uh, the enjoyment of the countryside for for the majority or for, for other walkers and other users um so yeah and there is an issue there's been a big issue with increasing littering and in, issues with dogs in amongst livestock i've had two or three reports of um, sheep being savaged i've also had reports of people being trampled by cattle which is the other side of the same point really, when people um aren't sure what to do with a dog and the dog it often attracts the attention of the captain so um, yeah, it's a tricky one. Um, I don't quite know, I don't have any solutions for it. I just think um, we, we all need to be vigilant and, and we all need to pull together. I know that in Stroud, um, and certainly on, in the walks I do, quite a lot of local people, including some of the ramblers, will go around picking up litter um, after, you know, you know, young people often are blamed for dropping litter. But certainly um, uh, I know local communities do pick up. Uh, to make sure that this isn't too big an impact on the livestock uh, nature and indeed um, farmers. I definitely agree with all those points and you know, agree with Jack's point about more access to more places will spread the load. I mean, anyone who saw the images of what's happening up the top of Snowdon, you know, during the COVID epidemic, it was almost like a, a dearth of geographic imagination of other places that you could potentially go was, was part of the issue maybe. Um, and also that we need better education in schools. I agree with those things as well. But I also think there's maybe a deeper rooted thing, particularly in England around, you know, maybe there's a self-fulfilling prophecy that if you don't have trust in a person, then they're not very trustworthy. You know, maybe there's, there's an issue in terms of how paternalistic we are as a society and how that paternalism and the sort of the way in which people expect people to behave in the landscape somehow actually means that people end up putting dog poos in bags and hanging them up on fences rather than looking off the landscape they're walking in every day. And when they do camp, they then leave their detritus behind rather than looking after it. And I wonder whether we actually create a culture that encourages that kind of activity. And, you know, this, this evening's conversation is partially about, you know, the right to roam. Maybe if we did have a right to roam in England as an, as an assertion or an idea, and we had more trust in people, maybe we would start seeing more respect from more people in the environment and the damage we do see being looked down on more, but also the damage being spread out a bit more over the countryside as well, rather than just in like particular ravines or something. Absolutely, Maybe. thanks, Sam. Thanks for your question, Dominic. Um, hopefully there's some inspiration there from the answers that we got. Um, Okay, so the next two questions are from Tim and Martin Whiteside. So I don't know, I think if you both ask your question, I think the answers can maybe be joined. So Tim, you're first, Tim Davies. Uh, yeah, and thanks for very inspiring presentations and kind of uh, insights. Um, but I think mine and Martin's questions were about kind of new rights of way, um, particularly thinking very local, you know, the, the, the housing developments that, that spring up that aren't permeable and there aren't ways through and how, how do or can new rights of way get created? Because we've talked a lot about those historic routes, um, but are there ways we can think about the, the connections we need to, to, to make the daily walks and the longer walks much, much better. Thanks, Tim. Okay. I can feel that Jack wants to go first and he's trying not to, so. <laughs> okay, okay. I mean, I don't have to. I, suppose, um, I think, well, there's a couple of things to say. I think um, the one thing to say is that in terms of uh, adding 
path to the definitive map, um, it isn't just about historic routes. There is also the ability, well, a couple of things. Landowners can dedicate rights away, um, which I think is an important thing to say. Um, the other thing is that um, if a path can be shown to be used by the public for 20 years, then it becomes a right of way. And there are quite a few of those that are unrecorded on the map as well. But what I suppose one of the potential opportunities that we've got very live at the moment is in, you know, it, you know, Brexit's happened, or you know, whatever you think about that, but Brexit's happened, and that we're moving towards a new agricultural payment um, system. And and you know, because of partly lobbying by the Ramblers, there will be in there. Um, payments for improved public access for land uh, to landowners. So, you know, there's obviously a lot around, um, you know, keeping watercourses clean and wildlife improvement and rewilding and uh, things like that. But one of the biggest payments potentially in the new system will be for improved public access. So I think that a, presents a real opportunity to, um, to you know, to, to really think strategically about the network. Where have we got, part, you know, where have we got links that don't exist um you know and that, thinking of dan's map earlier on yeah, how where have we got places where that wiggly line diverts the furthest from that straight line and can we you know we've got some big landowners in this country um, so you know there's it's it, there's a potential for for a significant longer route to be to be created as rights of way you know I, I would want to see them as formal rights of way not permissive not you know and so we can get and I think that does present an opportunity sort of going forward. Thanks, Joe. Um, especially because we are always desperately searching for positives of Brexit. So there's one, everybody. Um, Dan or Alan, did you want to come in? Dan? OK, Dan, then Alan, let's do that. Yeah, I was just going to. I was going to make Jack's point as well about Elms, the, the management scheme, which is you know, maybe a silver lining of Brexit. But we'll see whether or not the government actually follows through on, you know, what, what could otherwise be an interesting diamond out of all that. Um, I, what I'd like to say, I think there's like a, a general discourse in the way that conversations happen at the moment in the country that tend to put people against each other, even if they are necessarily maybe normally in agreement with each other. Sometimes, you know, access versus conservation versus farmer, whereas quite often farmers are environmentalists who like access and all this kind of stuff, you know, it's all very, quite often quite combative, really. And um, I give a talk to the Greens over in Herefordshire, actually, about slow ways. And a thing that came off that meeting was they were going to go away and just talk to the NFU to show them some mapping around where you could potentially have some better access through as a result of the mapping. And I don't know where that conversation went to, but the point I want to make is that unless we ask each other nicely enough, like, like if we went to the duchy in the Southwest and said, look, Prince Charles, did you know that you could create a route through here that would really improve kids' access to school or improve footpaths? I've got, I've got a feeling that actually he might kind of go for it if he was asked nicely, right? Um, so I wonder how many other landowners actually, if they were just had it pointed out to them, they were asked nicely, they would just kind of do it. And it doesn't necessarily always have to be um, some sort of combative, you know, all or nothing kind of scenario. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, Alan. Yeah, hi, I, I, I was going back. I think um, what Tim mentioned was an issue with housing developments as well. And, and for me, the, the, the best thing we can do in terms of improving access both from to and from housing developments and into the countryside is to engage early with the, the developer. And we, you, can do that, um, you can do that through Strand District Council, I imagine. Um, they, they certainly get a lot of contact uh, pre, before an application is put in. Um, as as right to work at the County Council, we often don't hear about a development until we, we find out that it's been applied for. So we don't have long to actually get very much for the public uh, in terms of, well, betterment or improvement to the right of way or indeed uh, provision of a decent right of way through, through, um, through a new development. And so sometimes it just becomes a sort of muddy path at the back of houses. Um, it's not ideal, but early, early engagement is the key. And we, we've been working with our, you know, with the planners in Stroud and, and in, in the other districts in the county to to make sure they're aware of rights of way and, and, and the importance of rights of way, both as uh, places for, for people to go and enjoy the countryside and have access, but also potentially as green corridors and, and places where it, which can allow people to experience nature close to their homes as well and give nature 
a chance. <laughs> Okay, thanks for that, everybody. Um, okay, so the next question I'm going to bring in um, is from Simon Jacobson, which I think is a really interesting question. Simon, if you want to unmute yourself. Hi there. Yeah. As, hi, thanks. Hi. As a frequent user of um, paths, footpaths, and discover of them, I sometimes find that it's the way marking, you know, um, that's the problem. And even on some long existing long distance routes, I walked a bit of the wisest way with a friend, which was a great, you know, it's a great idea to walk from the Y to the Thames, but it was really poorly waymarked. Um, and that's, you know, a supposedly long existing long distance path. So I'm just wondering how the slow ways, the slow ways concept is great, but how would you, how would you kind of make it easily nav navigable? Um, with with that issue about even the existing paths, even if they're not blocked or ploughed over, they're just, you can't find them. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, thanks, Simon. Danny, coming in first? Yeah, sure. It's a great question. Um, and just to say, so with slow ways, there's this iterative process where people can suggest routes and suggest better routes. And there's almost like this process of ecological succession where by people reviewing routes and surveying them, the routes options become more and more trusted until we end up with the best route potentially to get between say Stonehouse and Stroud or wherever it might be. That route could potentially in the future be signed. Um, we are on the fence about that because actually for many people signage is a controversial issue in the countryside. I think actually the politics of that for me is maybe that the people who don't like more signage in the countryside don't want more people going in those places and they benefit politically and emotionally from making the places slightly exclusive to them. A bit like in the war when we sort of like, you know, rubbed out the names of all the signs where they go. And it kind of bothers me slightly that if you are driving from London to Glasgow or Bristol to Swansea, then there'll be road signs with arrows that will tell you where you need to go. And you don't need a GCSE in geography or a Duke of Edinburgh award, you know, in order to navigate that route. And yet it seems to me that plenty of the, plenty of the signs are either absent from the landscape in the countryside, or if there's a roundel, there's like the name of like the dude in the 60s who invented the footpath with no arrows telling you which way to go, for example. And it's like this interesting breadcrumb in the landscape, which makes sense if you have a map. And then if you've got a map, maybe you don't need the breadcrumb there at all. Like, why not spend the extra 50p and have like an arrow and say where the arrow is pointing towards? Like, why don't we have roundels that use digital technology to tell people where they are and where they're going? Um, and why don't we also think about some ecologically sensitive ways to, to have better breadcrumbs that people can follow through the environment? So I'm very sympathetic to the point you know, there's all kinds of issues at the moment in the news around the intersectionality of inequity in our society. And I think excluding people from environments because of poor literacy from those environments is, is problematic. I think it's part of that, that, that overall issue. So, but, but I realize that some people are worried about um, there been too much signage of the landscape as well. I, I just challenge that principle to a large extent. But for slow way specifically, we're going to wait and see. What I think will happen is that some communities will want the signage and it will happen through them. And in other parts of the country, it won't necessarily happen. We, we don't want, our, the spirit of our initiative is not to come up with some big scheme and impose it on communities. Sounds like we need a vigilante signage group um, to start. So if, Simon, if you're thinking about it, let us know. Uh, Jack, did you want to say anything on that or Alan? Uh, yeah, I mean, I just, I suppose just to agree with Dan really, and, uh, but to, um, I mean, I think one, you know, I'm, yeah, I grew up in South East London. Um, I didn't, I don't think I saw an ordnance survey map until I was sort of in my mid twenties or something. I didn't, I wasn't taught the countryside code. You know, I, I'm a city boy at heart, but love going walking in the countryside and in towns and cities. Um, but now ordnance survey are, you know, it's a very obvious thing for me now, but who, you know, that it's a very, it feels, as Dan's saying, a very sort of exclusive club of people who, who understand these, these, you know, have, who have been taught and brought up with these sort of, uh, you know, ordnance survey apps and stuff like that. Wouldn't it be fantastic if the rights of way network was on Google Maps, you know, or wouldn't it, you know, if you could, you know, <laughs> that's partly, you know, 
especially if we're thinking about getting people out of cars and, and interact and getting them on public transport and stuff like that, you know, if you look on the map and you say, oh, well, it's a, an hour, an hour's walk between, you know, my village and the next town along or whatever. Well, actually, it's not. It's only 25 minutes if you use the rights of way to go across country. Wouldn't it be fantastic if those were actually, you know, on, on for instance, Google Maps um, so people could actually, you know, navigate more, you know, better across the landscape? Fantastic. Thanks, Jack. Uh, and thanks, Simon, for your question. Really appreciated. Um, okay, so I'm going to bundle the next two questions together because they're both for Alan um, and a very Gloucestershire County Council specific. So, um, Sue, if you want to unmute and ask your question, and then Chloe, if you want to unmute straight away and ask your question, and I'm sure Alan will be able to uh, bundle <laughs> the answer into one. Thanks, Sue. Hi, Alan. Um, I was just wondering, you, you talked about a backlog of, uh, of, of reports about paths, problems with paths, and I just wondered, do you, do you, is there potential for you to use volunteers to, to help you investigate these reports and find out if, for example, there are blockages and what the issues are, or is this something that you have to investigate as the local authority? Okay, thanks, Sue. And Chloe, if you want to mute and ask your question. Yeah, I just, um, I so I've had some some experience with Alan's department and I, they are brilliant, but very stretched already. And in the run up to 2026, I was just wondering whether there are more people, you know, promised on the way, because it seems like, um, you know, there's a head of steam around this fantastic campaign and there's just gonna be more and more initiatives to get paths recognized. And I just wonder what's going to happen as we get closer to the deadline. Okay, thanks both of you. Alan? Okay, thanks for that. Um, I'll start with Sue. Um, yes, we've got a backlog of reports and yeah, where we can, we do use volunteers and sometimes we'll say to someone who sends in a report, um, can you, can you uh, confirm it's in this location and um, you know, sometimes if they say, well, I'm from the parish council or have some sort of um, experience in this we might get them to talk to someone um it, it, it's difficult you don't know you don't want to push too much onto volunteers but we use for example the Cotswold wardens a great deal um so people who join the Cotswold wardens who are sort of the voluntary arm of the Cotswold a and a and b which has just recently been renamed the Cotswold national landscape um they are they've existed since about 1970 and they're um they're, they're a fantastic resource, they're always a mixed bag, you know, you, you get some people who are hyper keen and some people who don't really want to do too much and everything in between. Um, and, and they provide us, they, you know, we get more than a double our money, so to speak, from them because they'll go out and do some of that extra legwork for us. But it still doesn't mean they can't do, really do the emails first, they can't do the response to the formal complaint, they can't do the, they can't serve notices on landowners or, you know, farmers for um, ploughing and cropping or obstructing paths, uh, but they can do some of the soft stuff. And we, um, I've been talking to the team actually about getting them more involved in, in way marking, funnily enough, you know, that uh, Simon raised, uh, the, 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 um, it's interesting he raised the why is this way just going on to that previous question because I've just on behalf of the people who put together the why is this way actually bought some more of their roundels so they can mark the route better and that's because they don't have any money uh, we don't have a lot of money either and they're not cheap those roundels came to about 90 feet so um, when you're buying you know a couple of hundred that's quite a lot of money um, so yes, and what I want my team to do is use volunteers more, uh, more uh, as effectively as they can. So yeah, we're, we're happy to. But they're much. It's easy to use them if they're part of an organisation already, so that they've got a little bit of backup and support. Um, turning to Chloe's question, um, the um, there is an issue obviously building up to twenty twenty six, and there'll be an increase in. Um, uh, claims. We already have one, we bid for resources, um, a colleague actually, Karen Pierman, looks after the asset team who do, uh, who are dealing with definitive map stuff. Uh, they bid for one um, dedicated person and actually Andrew Holdy is doing that work. He, he stepped into it sideways from his existing role to uh, do the uh, community engagement side. So he's been talking to 
parish councils and the ramblers and, and, and the user bodies about the 2026 cutoff and trying to guide them and support them in making good claims because there's no point us, uh, well, it, it helps everyone if, if the quality of the claims is good in terms of the, the detail and the archive evidence presented. And he got a good idea what would be needed for a successful claim um, and what might be a bit sketchy. And certainly it, it would make good sense to focus on the ones which are more likely to be successful rather than the ones which are a bit sketchy, frankly. Um, so he's been doing that. I think as we build towards 2026, there will be a bit further funding to help with uh, the increasing number of modification orders uh, and claims that were processing, just because the numbers are going up and that deadline's looming. Um, I think that has been some push from the Ramblers to see if the government would push back the, the deadline, and that would certainly help. Um, but uh, yes, it's it's getting a bit more, a little bit more thought gradually. Yes, um, gradually. On this, the the the, the work that um, um, that's being done on this, on on the what's it called? The Don't lose your way campaign. I keep thinking it was the Lost Ways project because that was its original uh, guise back in the um, uh, about fifteen years ago. Um, the Ramblers and the British Horse Society are working quite closely together to actually make a good job of that and using um, the old maps to try and identify the, the paths which could be added on. So they're doing, they're working very constructively with teams like, like the one in Gloucestershire and in other counties as well to try and make this work. So we're really grateful for the user groups and that the constructive level of engagement we're getting it all really helps. Um, so yes, we will need more people uh, but the thing is, if the claim's been made, it'll go, it'll go in the list. And even though the 26, 26 deadline comes, it will, as long as we've we've received it, um, it will then be in the list of things to deal with and it doesn't that's disappear. Nice. So that's something. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Beth. Thanks, Sue and uh, Chloe. Okay, so um Loads of things to write to our MP about, increased funding for Alan, and also to make sure that um, improved access is on the cap payments. Okay, Jack, did you want to say something on that? It was just to, just to uh, build on Alan's point quickly. Um, you can see on our website, and I'll put the link in the chat, um, we are calling for a five-year extension at least to the cutoff date. Um, and we've got the rationale and stuff there. Um, and we are expecting a decision on that before the end of the year from, from the minister, but we, we shall see. Um, that is also supposed to come alongside, just to give the context, there were regulations um, that came under the Deregulation Act 2015 that was supposed to make this process a lot easier for all that still haven't come into place yet. So um, that's the sort of context we're working in and, and we're sort of hoping those will be this year as well, but, but we shall see. Okay, thanks, Jack. Um, great addition. Also, just to draw everyone's attention to the fact that our uh, open source data expert, Tim, has put in links to uh, benches and toilets mapping. So um, hopefully useful information there. Um, I'm going to have one more question, which was from Margot Smith, and then we'll do sort of a two minute closing remarks from our three speakers. Um, and hopefully we can finish on time for nine o'clock. So Margot, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? I know that, I think Chloe was coming back to you in the chat, which um, is a county councillor. Hello, um, it's not Margot, it's Angus. Hi Angus. <laughs> um, we're gonna check that out because it could be a permissive path, which as Chloe pointed out, the farmer has the right to uh, stop use of it but uh, we'll, but we need to check the definitive map first all right okay so fantastic answers uh, questions being answered in the chat and i've missed it great news so um i yeah. guess um it's just a general um question around landowners being able to uh, block different parts of their site um, okay, great then. So I think a lot of the rest of it is around um, conversation. Shout now if I've missed your question and you desperately want to ask it or forever hold your peace. Okay, I'm taking that as forever hold our peace. So let's do uh, final remarks from our three speakers and 
Um, let us know any call to actions that you want this group of people to take away from the session, please. Okay, so if we start with Dan, thanks. Yeah, well, great conversation. Um, and I think this is a really exciting area of work as well, because it's about our freedoms, it's about our rights, it's about access to nature, it's about how we connect with each other, with the land. It's about our story, it's about our future, it's about our past. You know, it's really powerful stuff we're dealing with. And ultimately, you know, there are, there are people who might want to give us more of those freedoms and other people who'd like to take them away by having arbitrary deadlines or, you know, other things going on. But you know, th this, th this evening was partially pitched around the idea of, you know, should there be a right to roam? Um, and actually, I would like to see a right to roam, but I'd like to see a right to roam that's coupled with a really good package of education and cultural work to make sure that the responsibility side of that is really strong. Um, and that leading ultimately to meaning that people know that how they can move through the landscape in a way that's respectful to, to nature, to farmlands, how they can sleep in the landscape in safe and respectful um, and clean ways. But ultimately, I think that's probably an intergenerational target, you know, in terms of how you get from that one place to another. And ultimately, we can look, some people mentioned Scandinavia, we can look to Scandinavia for models of success. You can look to parts of Australia, but you can also look to Scotland not necessarily in the banks of Loch Lomond, but but bits of Scotland. But what Scotland doesn't have, that England has, is fantastic footpaths. What Scotland needs is our footpath infrastructure. And what we need is their right to roam and attitude towards you know, the countryside. And if in our union, um, if, if we have one in the future, we could somehow learn from each other a bit more. I think that would be extremely powerful. Um, just to say on slow ways that It'd be absolutely fantastic if anyone wanted to go and walk a single route, lots of routes, combine lots of routes, leave reviews. Three reviews on a route means it becomes verified, which then means it almost goes into our definitive map, although it, things can get downrated again if, if they're not quite working out. And I'd also encourage Alan, who's on the call as well, to think about, you know, how could we get Gloucestershire maybe as the first full county to be fully verified? I think that part of that mission is about the routes that are there at the moment. But touching on what the conversation we have with Jack, it's also thinking about, well, how can we get slow ways mapped on and people using them that are routes that people have previously used that could be lost or where we would like to have routes in the future as well. Um, so as you go forward, thinking about getting involved with slow ways, I think that there's those other sides of the work to be thinking about as well. And obviously you could work on um, a single route and benefit Alan's work, Jack's work and the work that the volunteers are working on at slow ways as well. Thanks, Dan. Sorry, I was on muted myself. Um, we always have to have one. Um, Jack, if you'd like to go next. Yeah, just a couple of couple of points. I completely agree with Dan. I this is a very personal position and not the position of the Ramblers necessarily, but I wouldn't. If it was right to roam, replacing the public rights of way network, I would have concerns about that because I do think paths give us something they give us uh, confidence and certainty and i think sometimes the right to roam discussion is really focused at people who want to climb over highland moors and things like that whereas you know we i think that what the path network potentially gives us and does give us is is certainty for a greater number of people but, but i won't go down that too much um i think the the, the closing couple of things i'd say are that um you know, I think one of the themes of all of this, and I've seen in the chat as well, is 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 in. I think we really need to focus on on access to nature and and people being able to get out and cycle and and walk in nature. And you know, if if we spent a tenth of what we spent uh, on highways, on actual you know on motorways and roads, on the rights of way network, it would be absolutely fantastic. And and you know, we can we we would do so much more um the, the don't lose your way project shouldn't exist uh when the when this 2026 date was brought in the government said they were going to do this work and that didn't happen or they tried to do it but then they failed to do it um and so it's you know it's volunteers and it's charities like the ramblers are having to step up to assert the rights of the public and that shouldn't be the case you know it shouldn't be the case that the public need to assert their rights and need to make sure their rights are, are are legally defined but we are where we are um so i'd encourage everyone to go on to the to the don't use your way website 
see what paths are in your area. We won't be able to save them all. Um, some of them will be erroneous. Some of them we won't be able to find the evidence for. But you'll be able to see some of the possibilities of, of how the network could be better and, and sign up to, to get involved so people can, so you can actually, you know, delve into the history of your area, but actually, you know, not just for an interesting thing to do, but to actually create something tangible. And when a right way is added to the map, it is very likely that will be there for hundreds of years to come. And it's sort of, it's, it's very, um, it's rare that you get to leave that sort of, you know, a legacy that will, that will last that long. So I really urge people to get involved with that as well. Maybe while they're walking a slow way, they can see what's, what's, uh, what's branching off of it that isn't mapped. Thanks, Jack. Um, okay, Alan, your closing statement? It's just a quick one, really. I, I've, I've been inspired a bit by you other speakers. I think I think the Slow Waste Project is a fantastic opportunity to to start working out where where routes are available, which are available to people who who can't walk along paths full of styles. So actually, getting um, access for people who are less able-bodied, that might be older people, but might be people who have had misfortune of not having um, the the ability to climb styles or to go along. Uh, difficult paths um, I, I love the fact that that's being mapped um, and I wish we could do it and I'd like to work you know as closely as I can in you know within reason with with um, Dan in sorting that out equally I think the work Jack's doing is uh, quite inspirational uh, we need a, a, a thorough you know a, a thorough job done of this uh, don't lose your way project and um, th there's some really valuable routes can be added so um, probably my my real message is that's a great discussion, but let's let's keep working together to try and uh, move forward and get these things sorted. Thank you all. Absolutely. Thanks, Alan, for taking the time to join us this evening and our two other speakers. We really, really appreciate you uh, joining this discussion. I mean, if you look in the comments now, um, everybody is uh, sending love um, for the work that you're doing. Um, I think that you know using technology to map and protect nature and to help us connect with it more i mean i think jack said if we used um you know walking routes the tenth of the amount that we used um the roads then but i mean what if we use them a tenth of the amount that we use our phones i think that would be um equally as valuable uh, might make Alan's job a little bit harder, but um, uh, keep us all out and busy. But yeah, so, um, you know, challenge accepted. Stroud is going to be the first town district. Gloucestershire is going to be the first county um, to complete all of our walkways. So uh, get ready for that. I know uh, challenge to all our town uh, district and county councillors on that one. Um, but yeah, I guess the key message is... Um, you know, we'll miss it when it's gone. And so let's not let it go. Uh, thanks, everybody. You get five minutes back for uh, your evening. Uh, really appreciate it. This will be on our YouTube channel. Please share with your friends and colleagues who couldn't make it.